Okay, so it's uh, it's good to see everyone today, and I uh, hope everybody is doing well. Um, it is uh, very frustrating to be reading the news about how possibly Israel uh, might be uh, and Hamas reaching an agreement about the uh, release of hostages. Secret Secretary of State Blinken is in Israel as we speak. Uh, can only pray, pr pray for uh, their safety. So that's why I have the number 124 uh, on my shirt today, and uh, hopefully won't have to wear that number for too much longer. So the portion today is Mishpatim. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're on page 456 in the Eitz Chaim. It's chapter 21 of the book of Exodus, whatever edition of Chumash you have. Baruch HaTadonai, Yeloheinu Melech Olam, Sherkitshanu B'mitzvotav Tzivanu, La'asok B'divrei Torah. So uh, there's a, a lot said about uh, this portion in relationship to the other portions before, because we now, the Torah itself takes a radical shift in terms of literary style. So all of the book of Genesis, 20 chapters of the book of uh, Exodus so far have been narrative. Even the giving of the Ten Commandments are, that we read in last week's portion are presented as part of a narrative, not necessarily as the focus itself of the text, meaning that it is a description. The Ten Commandments are listed there as a description about what happened on Mount Sinai. And the Mount Sinai experience, the thunder, the lightning, the shofar, the Moses uh, on top of the mountain, and, and the people experiencing whatever they're experiencing and hearing whatever they're hearing is all part of this narrative. So it's, it's prose, it's a story. 50 chapters of Genesis, 20 chapters of, of Exodus so far, all part of, of the story. Lots of details in certain parts, especially last week, but again, just a story. Here, we see now a, a pivot. It, it is not a gradual shift from, um, from story to narrative. The, the editor of the Torah, whether it's God or, or we believe editors uh, within the, the Israelite communities centuries and centuries ago, the editor did not put in a paragraph to describe this shift now, where um, perhaps a, an editor of such a volume today would have insisted on something like that to help the reader understand why there's this shift now in style okay so just for, we we need to understand that shift and secondly the shift now is to what we think if we if we um if someone to ask were to ask us what's one word that you would use to uh, define what the Torah is. Arguably, you know, if you like watch Family Feud, the top 100 responses of what is the Torah, perhaps the number one response would be law. And there would be other responses, you know, the history, um, story of the Jewish people, or uh, uh, theology, something like that. But law, I think, would be the number one answer as to what the Torah is. And it's not until, it's not until we get to this page, this chapter in the book of Exodus, that we find law. Uh, again, I would argue that Ten Commandments are not law, they are foundational moral and ethical religious principles. They're not law. They're, they're the principles on which the laws of Israelite society are based. Okay, so um, again, so that's so that's it. It is fascinating then that if Torah is law, 
that it has taken this long in the Torah to get there, right? You have so-called laws in the book of Genesis, like be fruitful and multiply, but even when that's presented in that way, by God to Adam and Eve, it's just, it's not given in a context of this is what the law should be. Or when God says to Noah, when he gets out of the ark, you know, you should don't eat a, a, a lot, uh, don't eat a, a part of an animal, like don't pull off a part of an animal from an animal while it's alive to eat it. Right? So it doesn't seem like law, it just seems like general principle. The only law maybe uh, that you could argue is presented in Genesis is to circumcise boys on the eighth day. So, and that also is given in a context of, this is what makes the covenant between Abraham and his descendants and God unique. So it's, it, again, it's not given in a context of lots of other laws. So, so all of that, just to say that this, it, it, what, what to keep in mind as we're reading a portion now, as we, as we are, confronted with with this heart, harsh shift in literary style okay and then the the first verse of the portion ve'ele hamishpatim asher tasim lifnehem and the english leaves this out and it's really important the letter vav is really important there for the for the word ve'ele for some reason, the English translation just says, these are the rules. It should be, and these are the rules that you shall set before them. The, the word and is important here. So for the editor, it's the word and that serves as that transition uh, and, and pivot in style. That's it, just the letter vav. And in the English translation, we miss out on the transition. No transition at all. Just these are the laws or these are the rules. Okay. So why is the and? We, we're not left hanging or we're not left understanding the end of Yitro that we're missing something. So the portion Mishpatim provides us what we're missing with. If you think that the Israelite society only needs the Ten Commandments, then we should understand that the portion Mishpatim is coming to fill in the gaps, right? The, the Ten Moral Principles, Ten Moral Religious Ethical Principles that serve as the foundation of society aren't enough to, uh, to ensure that, this, that society will function properly. We need more specific laws in order to ensure that uh, people get along well. So it highlights the idea that human nature is such that if we leave humans to their own devices, people will get hurt. If not, people will die if people are left to their own devices. Right? We see that in society today and how, how many laws are on the books in each state and in the federal government, and still people flout the rules and still uh, injure and kill uh, other humans every day, uh, intentionally and unintentionally. Right? So we need law to ensure that the number of people murdered every day, every year, is kept to as minimum, as, as small a number as possible. Imagine how high the number would be if there were no laws at all. If we only had the Ten Commandments and everybody abiding by the laws, abide by those principles in, in their own way. It would be it, it, dystopian novels may have been written about something like that, right? There wasn't there a movie about uh, one day a year that uh, 
the society set aside for people to not have to follow the laws, right? I think there was a movie like that that came out a couple years ago. So there, there are novels written about that, right? Uh, as, uh, as opposed to utopian, uh, a view, a positive view of the future, you have dystopian, a negative view of the future. And um, so that's, that's what society would be like. Uh, a, it would be a dystopian future. So we have Mishpatim as the first example in the Torah of such laws set aside. We'll have next, after Mishpatim, Five, four and a half portions that talk about the laws of how religious, how the religious component of society is to be set up. Very, very specific laws about the the Mishkan, about the um, vestments, etc., uh, and, and other uh, vessels being used in the Mishkan. Not only. How, how they're supposed to be designed, but then how they were designed. And you have most of the book of Leviticus about the sacrifices offered as well. And then you have other laws in, in Numbers and Deuteronomy that kind of um, work in parallel to what the laws are presented here in, in Mishpatim. So a variety of laws, uh, both uh, civil law, and religious law presented here. So let's look at, at the beginning of this portion. And then I wanna switch abruptly to the sixth Aliyah too. So hopefully we'll have time to do both. So I just wanted to read the beginning of, of Mishpatim. Again, we're on 456. And these are the rules or the laws that you should set before them. Uh, verse two, ki tikne. Eved Ivri, Shesh Shanim Yavod, Uvashviit, Yetse Lechavshi Chinam. The first of all the laws that you can imagine being presented, right? Um, what, what, what specific law you want to highlight? Maybe laws of murder, maybe laws of business, maybe. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. There could be a whole variety of laws that could have uh, you, we could have thought be presented first. This one of slavery. So it's it is eved is translated as slave. In this context, though, it really needs to be understood as indentured servant. Okay, so a slave, right? The uh, avadim hayinu. Uh, right? We sing that in the Haggadah. We were slaves in Egypt. Now we are free. So yes. So when we we see this word Eved, we are connected automatically with what the Israelites were in Egypt just three months ago. Right? If we're reading this chronologically, uh, if we think that this portion is um, uh, immediately follows what the revelation of God at Mount Sinai that we just read in in last week's portion. If we if we if if this is not a separate unit just put here, then the people who are being talked to here by, by Moses on behalf of God is just three months removed, really, to it because it was in the third month. So just seven weeks removed from Egypt, okay? So uh, the word Eved here is, should be translated as slave, but how the slave is treated here is not the way the Israelites were treated as slaves in Egypt, right? So, so I just wanna keep, make sure we understand that and that really a technical, a better translation of Eved in this context as being described here is indentured servant, which means that you're giving yourself up to work as an indentured servant for somebody else in, because you're in debt or because you have no other choice uh, or means, means available to support yourself 
and your family. Okay, so you agree to work for someone um, as an Israelite for six years. And then in the seventh, you're set free. Okay, now there are options, we'll see, there'll be options if you want to continue. But again, so un unlike slavery in Egypt, which was permanent, and children were born into slavery and they knew no other life other than slavery, there's the option here, so which makes this the initially different, is when you purchase a Hebrew slave, six years he will work, that is, work for you. And in the seventh, he will uh, go out free and clear, okay? Free without payment. So just free and clear. He doesn't owe you any more money, right? So if somebody it needs to pay off a debt, that debt has to be paid off in six years. And the, we'll read in the book of Leviticus that uh, it's a seven-year agricultural cycle, and paying off a debt means that it's in the seventh year of the, the sabbatical year, you're set free. So no matter how much you're, so if you owe somebody money, in the sixth year of the seventh year, you take on a debt in the sixth year and you can't pay off the debt. You only have that one year to pay it off. You're lucky and you set, you're set free in the seventh year. If it's the first year of the seven year cycle, then you have six years to pay it off. Okay, so the way um, the rabbis understood that um, this is detrimental to those who make a loan or those who's, who uh, are on credit, are a creditor to somebody else. Nobody want, would want to make a loan with somebody in the sixth year of the seven year cycle uh, on, on threat of it not being paid off and then no other option. You're essentially then uh, forgiving the debt. So the rabbis created something called the prose bool, which is uh, uh, Rabbi Hillel uh, created that loophole in which the court takes over the debt. So let's say I owe money to Saul and it's the sixth year of the seven year cycle, that, that debt that would be written down in a document would be purchased by the court. So then I would still need to pay off this debt but the court is, is the one that is the owner of that debt now, and I would pay, make payments to the court, or I'd be indebted, I, I'd be in servitude to the court, and the court would pay Saul. Okay, so the, the court then becomes the middleman, so that we're not uh, technically not indebted to, I'm not indebted to Saul anymore, and technically I'm free of the debt from Saul, but I am indebted to the court instead. So that keeps society functioning in a way that uh, things don't just stop in the sixth year or the seventh year cycle. And that the same thing would happen even worse in, this, in the Jubilee year, as, as the book of Leviticus points out, where mortgages are forgiven and uh, the original owner takes over ownership of a house. So um, we would have then, um, uh, uh, so then he would have, uh, we would, uh, the, so the, the prose bull uh, takes even uh, uh, more detail in, in the Jubilee year. Um, so there's, I want to look below the line about just what, what the impact of this law about slavery is doing here as we begin Mishpatim. So we're setting up a society that is a civil society, that, is a res that it is a, a response to um, what happened in Egypt. And so uh, there could be people, it's, so let's read below the line on 457. The legal code begins with the treatment of slaves, even as the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, begins with a reference to Israel's enslavement in Egypt, right? I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. That's commandment number one. Uh, and here, 
uh, reminding us about being slaves in Egypt. For many modern readers, the subject raises questions about the morality of the Torah's legislation. Now, why, why um, legislate about slavery? Why allow slavery of any, kind, of any sort to be written into the law code? First, how can God countenance slavery? So first, right, if it was bad for the Israelites, it should, because God heard the Israelites cry in Egypt and set them free, why isn't it permanent freedom? Why couldn't God create society in such a way that indentured servitude doesn't need to be an option? So first, we must note that this passage does not re refer to the Egyptian model of slavery, a condition of cruel, permanent bondage. It deals with people who find themselves obliged to sell their labor for a fixed time to repay a debt or as a result of bankruptcy, right? It's, you're, you have no other way to pay off a debt. You don't have property to, to give instead of money. So uh, you give yourself. Okay. Second, the Torah's overall emphasis on human freedom and dignity its insistence that humans are called to serve God and not a human master in time led to a strengthening, strengthening of the rules protecting the rights of slaves and ultimately to a rejection of slavery entirely. So yes, that did happen, but it took a while in rabbinic law to do this, right? Because the, the rabbis of the Mishnah, the first law code, edited by the rabbis in Israel in 200 CE was written at a time or developed at a time of the Roman Empire when there were slaves in the Roman Empire. So slavery was a fact in the Roman Empire. So then the laws, this law, these laws here in the Torah could be interpreted by the rabbis in a way that would humanize the laws, the Roman laws of slavery, okay? So that in, in context of the time, then the, uh, the rabbinic laws and interpretations of these laws from the Torah are more humane than how the Romans would treat slaves, okay? So never in rabbinic times would uh, the rabbis agree to throw slaves to the lions in, uh, in the Colosseum, okay? That would just not be a way to treat your slave um, in, in Jewish law. So within context, right, law, law is moral based on the time the law is written, right? So it used to be moral to not allow women to vote. It used to be moral to, uh, to I don't know, uh, I can't think of another law just like that over to, that we can, what, no, it used to be legal to own slaves in America, okay? So it, it takes a while and sometimes it takes a war to change the attitude of the country about what now is a basic understanding and a basic principle right so for nearly a hundred years it was legal to own slaves in america until the civil war ended that um, it was um illegal for women to vote until the amendment was passed to allow women to vote only just over a hundred years ago okay so lots of other examples like that so we need to keep that in mind so we can't expect our understanding of morality today, which has evolved in incredibly since the time of the Torah, that we, can't under, we shouldn't expect our morality to be reflected in the Torah, right? So another example of that would be attitudes towards homosexuality. Right? Attitudes towards homosexuality today is more forgiving and more accepting, even in, in non Orthodox Jewish law today, than obviously it was in the Torah. So then it would be a, a matter of reinterpreting the words and the laws themselves 
to understand uh, the new morality from the old words written in the Torah. So it doesn't mean to throw out the words, doesn't mean to rewrite the words, it means to reinterpret them. So that th these laws of slavery, to the point where you might even have to ignore the law itself, to say that it just doesn't apply at all, and there's no, there's no, it, there's no place for any of this at all anymore. Okay, so that's, that's how law works, and that's the, the, the system that the rabbis instituted uh, that became um, yeah, part of what, it, what is the normative Jewish way of uh, interpreting the Torah and behaving in life every day. Okay, so the, the commentary goes on. The status of a slave in the Torah was better than that of a slave in Egypt, but still fell, sh fell short of the Torah's vision of innate human dignity. This chapter still considers the slave and his or her family as the master's property and calls for decent treatment. Deuteronomy, seen by most scholars as a later compilation, considers slaves as virtually members of the master's family to be included in festival celebrations and sent off with gifts at the end of their period of service. This chapter simply states when you acquire a Hebrew slave. The parallel text in Deuteronomy 15 begins, if a fellow Hebrew is sold to you. It would seem that the Israelites newly freed from Egypt could not imagine a society without slavery any more than Plato or Aristotle could. But over the course of time, a more humane view of the slave evolved. Okay, so again, for some, for some moderns, it's even with that explanation as brief it is, as it is below the line on the page, still might not be enough and still might be uh, repulsive to read. Um, so I would say uh, for those progressives and liberals within the community, you know, there's a lot of things to be rep repulsed about, but in under, in, uh, to understand Jewish history appropriately, we have to put things in context. And it doesn't mean that we have to throw it away. It could mean that we ignore it. Yes, we don't use these laws anymore. Yes, but it doesn't mean, look how disgusting the Torah is. No, we should never understand the Torah that way. We should understand it in context and see, look how great the rabbis are to have instituted a system by which we can evolve. So it's thanks to the rabbis for putting a system in place that allows us not to read the Torah literally. Okay, and any time anybody suggests that we need to read the Torah literally, then they are really outside of the pale. They are not working within the system of Jewish law. Okay, um, so I want to now turn in the time we have left to page 474. So from this point on uh, the beginning of the Parsha, um, on 456 until 474, we have all the laws that the portion Mishpatim wanted to present. Okay, so now uh, at verse 20, the beginning of the sixth Aliyah, we now shift again at the end of all these laws that were presented. Okay, and now a context is going to be presented for or a reason why, or made motivation for, um, for uh, following this covenant. So we're on 474, verse 20, the beginning of the sixth Aliyah, whatever edition of Chumash you have, just look for that, chapter 23, verse 20. Hine anochi sholeyach malach lefanecha, lishmarcha baderech, vilahaviacha el hamakom asher hachinoti. So, just a dramatic shift here. Behold, I am sending before you an angel to guard you, protect you uh, on the way and to bring you to the place that I have set aside or that I have made ready. He shamer mi panav ushma bekolo al tamerbo ki lo yisa lefish achem ki shemi bekirbo. Listen to him or be wary in front of him 
and listen to his voice. Don't defy him because he will not pardon your sins because my name is in him. So there's some power, authority to this angel that's walking in front of the people to protect them, to lead them to the land of Israel. Don't sin because this angel will not pardon you. 22. If you listen, truly listen to his voice and do everything that he says, I will make, no, I will become an enemy to your enemies. In other words, I'll make your enemies go away and I'll be a foe to your foes. I'll make your foes go away. So listen to the angel and everything will just fall by the wayside. People will just fall away and you won't have to have any worries. But if you sin, there's not going to be any pardon for your sins. 23. When my angel walks before you, and brings you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, I will annihilate them. Don't bow down to their gods. Don't worship them, or it's the same word from the beginning. Don't be enslaved to them. Don't uh, act like them. Rather, destroy them and break their idols or smash their pillars to bits. Vavadetem et Adonai Elohechem. Uverach et lach mecha, vet me mecha, vahasiroti machala, mikir becha. Be enslaved, right? I got to use it in the same context. If we have Eved at the beginning, we have Eved here. Yes, it's translated as to serve the Lord your God, but really, you shall be enslaved to God your God. And, God, and, and he will bless your bread and your water and will turn away all disease from before you, right? So there won't be enemies before you and there won't be disease before you. Your food and your water, your bread and your water are going to be blessed. And we, lo tehiye meshakela va'akara ba'artsecha et mispar yamecha amale. No woman will be will miscarry, and there won't be a barren woman in your land. The, you, you will live the fullness of your days, or you will enjoy the full count of your days. Okay, you'll live a full life, right? Listen to the angel that has God in the angel. That is, follow all these laws that I've set before you, and nothing bad will happen to you. The, the land will be fertile. Your women will be fertile. There won't be any disease in your land. You will thrive. 27. Et emati ashalach lefanecha, vahamoti et kol ha'am asher tavo bahem, venatati et kol oivecha elecha oref. I will send down my fear before you, and I will kill all the people, or, or not, no, I will throw a panic for, for all the people who, um, all the people among whom you come, right, in other words, all the people of the land of Israel will be thrown into a panic, and I'll give your enemies before you, I'll make your enemies before you turn around. Uh, they'll run away from before you. 
28, Veshalachti et hatsir alefanecha, Vegersha et achivi et aknani, Vet achiti milfanecha. I'll send, uh, I'll send a plague before you, which will drive out the Chivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. Lo argar shenu mi panecha bashana achat, pentieha aret shmama, veraba alecha chayat hasadeh. I'll, I won't drive them out in a single year, lest the land be desolate and, and there'll be lots of wild animals to hurt you. Ma'at agar shenu mi panecha ad asher tifrev and achaltat aret. Slowly, slowly, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Now, the book of Judges that we're reading in Bible class on Fridays is a direct response to this. The, and the book of Joshua and Judges describe this slow process of settling the land of Israel and how the people of Israel didn't maintain their faith in the process. In other words, here the people are, God is saying, this is how it's going to be. Just follow my laws. And don't worry about the process of how long it'll take for your enemies to flee from before you. They're going to flee, and, and it's going to be slow because I'm taking care of you. I don't want the wild animals to suddenly uh, have, um, have, um, have a, a authority over you because there's no people there. So it's going to be wild animals before you. It's going to be fearful. Now, it's got to be slow, and you still got to... Worship me. 31 Vishati et Gvulcha mi am suf viad yam plishtim, umi mi bar ha nahar, ki atain bi et chem et yoshve ha aretz vegerash tam o mi panecha. And I will set your borders from the Reed Sea to the, the Sea of the Philistines, which is one way to refer to the Mediterranean Sea, from the desert to the river. I write the river being the Jordan River because I will uh, I will give into your hands to set those inhabitants of the land and I will drive them out before you. Don't establish with them and their gods a covenant. Lo yeshvu pen yachatiu otchali. Don't, they, they won't remain in your land because they might cause you to sin against me and, and you will worship their gods and it will be a snare for you. Okay, so what we have here in Mishpatim then is in this part of Mishpatim, the reason why we're supposed to follow the law. It's not about creating a just society, that you're going to be better people for this, that you're going to be uh, holier, you're going to be more moral and ethical. No, it's not about that. It's about showing um, that you believe in God, right? So we might think that the purpose of law is to make us better people. The purpose of law as presented here is to make us better believers in God. Okay, so that might be hard to, to swallow, but that's how it's understood here. Book of Deuteronomy adds that flavor of being a better, of being better people there. Even the book of Leviticus adds the, the, a, a different layer to that. We should be a holy people that... Um, by 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 following the laws you become holy here it's not like that you're following the laws because you're listening to the angel which is you're listening to god and it's preventing you from being idolatrous All right so the initial reason then for these laws as presented in mishpatim is is to uh and to um show and exhibit that you are full 100% loyal believer of God. Okay, so the uh, the rabbis though incorporate uh, the all the reasons given in the Torah for uh, observing 
a halachic lifestyle. That is, the rabbi set up for us the system of 613 mitzvot uh, and the system of halacha, of Jewish law, that is supposed to guide us um, from the moment we wake until the moment we go to sleep every day. And the reason we follow a halachic lifestyle, the reason why Judaism is halachic is as presented here in Mishpatim, to show our 100% faith in God. God commanded us to have and live by a halachic lifestyle, to be a holy people, which we'll read in the portion Kedoshim in the book of Leviticus, and to make sure that we become better by taking care of the disadvantaged and poor in the community. Okay, so all those reasons become uh, part of what it means to be halachic. Now, biblical scholars might suggest, well, we have one author, one trend that is presented here for why we are observing the law, and that's the, uh, that is to believe in God. We, we have another trend, uh, an oral tradition that's in Leviticus, that is to be holy, and another trend in Deuteronomy to be, um, to make society uh, better. Uh, so that there won't be poor people among you. So these different trends then come together in the entirety of the Torah. Okay. Um, I think that's, uh, that's what I wanted to cover here. Any, any questions or comments uh, about any of this that we've read so far? Okay, uh, we'll stop here for today and uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the day and um, a good rest of the week as well and um, we will be meeting next wednesday uh, when we will continue with the portion uh, truma next week so have a good again a good rest of the day and we pray for peace in israel take care Yashikoa. 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 Yashikoa.